we go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I am John Haig, and I am the co-director of the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government. Um, we are incredibly fortunate today. Um, we have Dick Light with us. And just so you know, Dick has been a long affiliate of the um, uh, Center for Business and Government here at the Kennedy School. He is also um, at the uh, Graduate School of Education. Formerly, he is the Carl Forsheimer Professor of Teaching and Learning at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and at the Kennedy School. Um, I also have to confess, um, I am a Kennedy School graduate, 1982 MPP. And in my first year here as a graduate student, I had Dick Light teach me about decision sciences. Um, and in particular, we did a case on LNG tankers in, uh, uh, in, in Boston. And I, I still remember the case. And I still remember the superb teaching job that Dick did. Um, his actual PhD is in statistics from Harvard. Um, and after years of teaching statistics, he basically shifted gears and focused on higher ed, bringing that rigorous uh, kind of analytic and, and scientific mindset to addressing some of the issues in higher ed. Um, he's been here through four Harvard presidents, uh, Derek Bach, Neil Rudenstein, Larry Summers, and Drew Faust. So he He's seen everything probably at, at Harvard. He's leading a number of projects right now, and we'll talk about one of them today, but or more generally. But um, one is the exploration with leaders from Duke, Brown, Georgetown, and Harvard on how to help first-generation college students to succeed. Um, the second is a collaboration with colleagues, uh, colleague Howard Gardner to explore and reinvent the new liberal arts for the 21st century. And the third, um, uh, just as an example, is to tackle controversy is higher, edu higher education. Um, uh, he is um, at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as an elected fellow. Um, and there he chaired a, a project on diversity and changing demographics at colleges. Uh, so very timely. His book, Making the Most of College, won the Stone Award for the best book about education and society. Um, and he's won a number of other awards for being such a, such a great teacher. And I can speak firsthand that, that uh, they're all true. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dick. Um, no slides today. Uh, he's, this is a nice, nice reprieve to some extent. He's just gonna talk. Uh, we'll, we'll go, he's gonna talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And then he's gonna come back and talk for another 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll open up for, for Q&A again. If you have a question, you can put it into the Q&A uh, part of the, the Zoom um, uh, application and we will track them and try to make sure we raise them um, with Dick. And with that, Dick, the floor is yours. Um, and I can't wait to hear the title of his uh, discussion today is how can a university move from good to great? Thank you, John Hague, you're the best. Thank you for the gracious introduction. Uh, by the way, can everyone hear me loud and clear just before we, before I start? I'm, I'm a, okay, good. Anyway, uh, I am indeed Richard Light, Dick Light. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, what I will say is um, this topic is something that I actually just finished uh, the final steps, putting practically the final steps on a manuscript for my next book. So in a way, this is a trial run for me, uh, and I hope you'll find this useful. As John said in the introduction, I'm not going to use slides that's intentional, that's purposeful. Rather, I'm going to share with you a whole lot of very short anecdotes. Every anecdote, it does, I'm not making it up as I'm going along. This is carefully prepared. Everyone is designed to make a point. And if you find half the points I make helpful, everyone wins. So here goes. Um, first, if you think about American colleges and universities, I know we could talk about uh, the Sorbonne and the University of Copenhagen and, you know, so on and so on. But let's focus, we need to start somewhere, focus on American colleges and universities. I think most all of you who are logged on listening, you know very well, there are hundreds that most of us, reasonable people, would consider really quite good. But there are far fewer that most of us realistically would say are truly great. I will go so far as to say Harvard, in my judgment, is obviously great. There, you know, I, We could easily mention 20 or 30 or maybe even a few more other names. But the point is, I'd like to focus on the difference between a pretty good versus a very, very good college. One of the things I've done in my own work, a quick word about myself in addition to what John said, I try to visit, you have no way to know this, one campus a month. Obviously, COVID has screwed that up. I have not visited in a year. 
But for the 20 years before that, I visited one university a month. Now, 20 years, 12 months a year, you all can do the arithmetic. 12 times 20 equals 240 campuses. Maybe it was 230, maybe it was 250, but that's the ballpark. The result is having visited, you know, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Williams, and other such places, but also Columbus State University, Southwest Georgia State University, places very different from Harvard. What I'm now gonna share with you comes from the cumulative learning um, that I have as a takeaway. And my last introductory comment is this is gonna be evidence-oriented, evidence -oriented, not Richard Light's opinion. Here goes. I wanna start three big themes. If you need a takeaway, I hope you find this helpful. It'll take two minutes. Three big differentiators between great universities and the many that are pretty good, pretty good, nothing bad. One, this is a big deal for me, and I sometimes struggle a bit to get to understand what I'm referring to. It's the importance of a university having a certain culture. Culture for me is a big deal. It's an important word. I'll use the word, another word, innovative culture. Some universities are constantly working in a sustained way to try new ideas, new ways of teaching, new ways of advising, new ways of uh, testing students, new ways of assigning homework, new opportunities for what you all, you students, if you're students, can do outside the classroom. New ways to help students who come to a demanding place like a Harvard or a Duke or a Georgetown or a Brown or you know, you know the list. They come to such a university and they may be a bit underprepared because they did not go to a very good high school. They're smart as can be, that's why they're admitted. And they come to Brown or Duke or with Georgetown. And then the question is, how do you help them succeed? Well, that's what I mean by innovative culture. And I'm gonna share my first personal anecdote. It's personal, but I think it drives things home better than any way I can think of. A year ago, before the COVID virus, I have uh, two grandchildren, two very small grandchildren. They live in Philadelphia. I took them to the U US Open Squash Finals. The number one and two ranked men played against each other in the whole world. And the number one and two ranked women played against each other. And I have never, I've never set foot on a squash court in my life, just to be clear, but I love watching the, uh, watching the games. Here's the point. I'm looking with my grandchildren at the names of the finalists. The two men finalists, Ali Farag, I actually met him because he's Harvard class of 14. He graduated seven years ago. I knew him a little bit. Anyway, and then Mohammed El Sherbagi. Um, the two women finalists, Nur El Tayeb and Nuran Gohar. And both of my grandchildren looked at me and said, those are slightly unusual names. Um, are, where do they come from? Where did they grow up? And so we looked it up. Um, Ali Farag uh, grew up in Cairo. Mohammed El Sherbagi grew up in Alexandria, as in Alexandria, Egypt. Nur El Tayeb, woman player, Cairo, Egypt, um, and Nuhan uh, Gohar grew up in Alexandria, Egypt. So we had four finalists, all four were Egyptian. My grandson, very young, looked at me and said, Grandpa, how can this be? What, how many people are there in Egypt? All I'm, I see nothing but Egyptians here. And I said, gee, I really am not sure of the population. Let's Google it. We found there are 100 million people approximately, 100.4 million people as of last year in Egypt. And so that's about 1% of the world's population, a little more. So my grandson just said, well, I'm not a mathematician, but 1% and all four of them are here. That's impossible. The math is impossible. I'm done. The point of that example is I said to my grandchildren, it's about culture. The, the Egyptian culture obviously encourages squash. The kids are playing in tournaments when they're seven or eight or nine years old. And that's true of all these four. All right, that's my, that's my simple example. Culture matters. Peter Drucker, the late management uh, consultant, was famous for saying, culture tops strategy every time. In fact, culture eats strategy for lunch. Okay, the second big idea, the differentiator is to engage students in the process of innovation for any college or university. Ask them questions, survey them. You don't have to ask, or if you're at the University of Michigan, which is a great university, you don't, you don't have to ask all 32,000 undergraduates about their individual experiences. Choose a sample of 50, only 50. 
remember, I'm a, I'm a statistician. My, my training is in statistics, my background. That's a decent sized sample. You'll get the big picture from asking only 50. What's going well? What's going not so well? You just finished your first year, your freshman year here. What's one thing the University of Michigan could do better with its teaching, with its advising, with its campus life? Anyway, students have no shortage of ideas. Great universities ask and capitalize on the suggestions. The third differentiator, again, this is a very big deal. Em to me, emphasizing personal relationships. In other words, I'm always stunned when I, teaching at graduate schools at Harvard, the Kennedy School or the Grad School of Education, I'm frankly taken aback when I meet a student who comes, often it's from a large public university, and I, and I just say, I'm curious, did you have close relationships with your advisors, with any faculty member? And I've had many students say something like, oh, I never even knew the name of an academic advisor. And most of my classes were large. Therefore, I never got to know any faculty member. I mean, I, I don't want to be critical of any particular place. It's rather just say, that's obviously a bit of a shame. And that's the difference between a great versus a uh, less than great college. Okay. That all, that all said, um, are there some questions that will distinguish between a great university and a not so great university? And I have come up after multiple visits to different campuses, I have come up with one question that seems to be the best predictor of where you wanna might, where you might wanna send your children. How's that? I mean, I have my kids and grandkids. I think of this, when I'm sitting with a president I will sometimes, or with a provost or a dean, someone in charge at some college or university, I will often simply ask, I say, I have a question, I'm curious. Um, uh, besides doing their academic research, what in your judgment as the leader or as a leader of this campus should be the main goal of faculty, of instructors, of professors on this campus? Roughly half of the People I ask that question, the campus leaders say, oh, well, of course our faculty should be teaching their subject, chemistry, history, economics, philosophy, whatever the heck it is, they should be teaching it and they should do it very, very well. Um, that's it. The other half say, oh, of course it's obvious our faculty are teaching their students. In other words, one group uses the words are teaching their subjects. The historians are teaching history. The economists are teaching economics. The other group uh, at the strong, at the great colleges, describe their, the faculty's mission as teaching students. Basically, you're teaching human beings. And that drives a lot. Faculty at great universities understand. Um, they understand that their goal in the end, they're teaching individuals with their idiot, all the idiosyncrasies and so on. Okay, uh, here goes. Uh, John, can you hear me all right? John Haig, I wanna ask you a individual question. It'll take, it's just two sentences. Can you hear me okay? You're, you're actually muted. If you unmute yourself, John. Yeah, I just have a question. It's just I can hear you. you. Great, you're, you're, on the, you're on the screen. So I'm just gonna ask you a question, all right? My big quickie, it's a, here goes. Uh, I vaguely remember you went to Grinnell College some years ago, because we've known each other for a while. Do I have that right? You have that correct. Right, all right, Grinnell College, kind of in the middle of the country. Is it in Iowa, do I have that right? It is in Iowa, and I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa. All right, so this is great. I have a simple question, John. Some years ago, when you arrived as a brand new first year student, how did you assemble your board of advisors at Grinnell? Uh, to be perfectly frank and honest, um, I did not. <laughs> okay. <That's, laughs> I'm, gl I'm glad you said that because most everyone at any campus, including our beloved Harvard would say the same thing. So here's an example of something that we, by we, I mean, there are a whole bunch of us who are meeting regularly at the Kennedy School at the Grad School of Education. We're going to suggest that more campuses try and that's invite every student to assemble a board of, a board of advisors. Now, not the first day they arrive on campus because they, you know, they're trying to figure out where's the bathroom, where, where are the restrooms here anyway, uh, or get to know their roommate. But imagine six or eight months into the first year, every new student is invited to assemble a board of advisors. And the way I have described it, which my, my colleagues, the deans seem to find appealing, 
And so I just said, you know, some students need an advisor for a reason. Others want an advisor for a season. And yet others would like to find an advisor forever. And I'll explain that in one second. I just want to say with, with attribution, that suggestion came from a fellow, a senior fellow at the center, at, at the Mosul Barani Center for Business and Government, Robert Steele. He and I were talking and he came up with that. And I thought, God, that's a great idea. I didn't think of that. So I want to give him the credit. Okay. So his idea, but I shared it with a bunch of deans. It's very interesting. The deans of the top-notch places all said, that's complicated, but it's worth our trying even on a small pilot study basis. The leaders of the less good universities just said, no, it's too complicated, it's too complicated. By, and just to be clear, an advisor for um, a, a reason means help me make one decision, like which classes should I take? I just arrived on campus. I just arrived at Grinnell. I need to choose four classes this fall, which ones? Help me choose. That's a reason, it's very focused. Then there's an advisor for a season. That might be the economics major at any college or university at Michigan State or, you know, Swarthmore or whatever it may be. Um, and um, that's, uh, there's a student and they're going to write a thesis, a, a major paper in economics. They need a supervisor for more than just a couple of meetings. And then there's the forever. And that might be, how do you think about the rest of your life? How do you plan a productive career? If, how do you think about your social life and so on? Okay, I'm going to try to cover a lot because then I'm going to stop and invite questions, but I want to get a few more ideas out. The Board of Advisors is an example of something that I think, I'll just say, I think student advising is probably the most underappreciated feature of a great college education, a great university education. And sometimes advising from the perspective of advisors like me is hard. It's often easy, but sometimes it's hard. And I have a very uh, specific example. Um, about three years ago, I was teaching a class here, graduate students, uh, master students. One of the strongest students in the class was a fellow named Steve. I won't use his last name. Um, he was African-American. And uh, he handed in his first two homework assignments. Both of them got a B minus. Both of them were exploding with great ideas. Both of them were just horribly written. So I invited him to come to the office and he immediately happily accepted. You know, we got along wonderfully well. And I just said, Steve, I have a delicate question to ask you. My, my point, what I'm trying to convey is it's not easy always for an advisor to do this. Here I am an older white guy and I'm talking to a 26 year old black guy. And, and I just said, Steve, I love your papers. They're an A plus on the ideas, but you know, they don't have a beginning, a middle and an end and they're full of grammatical mistakes. Are you willing to accept some assistance to improve your writing? You can be spectacular. He looked stunned for about 10 seconds. And then he said, Professor Light, you are the first person in my entire college career and graduate school career who's had the courage to tell me the truth and what I needed to hear. So I felt very awkward for a few seconds, but I'll be grateful for the rest of my life. Yes, I will go to the writing center. Can you tell me where I should go? And I did. The end of the story is he ended up with an A minus in the course. And I closed the semester by saying, which PhD program are you applying to, Steve? And he stared at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, you're really good. How, why haven't you applied? The end of the story is he is as we speak this minute a PhD student at USC, University of Southern California, and I volunteered to write him a recommendation. He's good, but you all can understand, young black graduate student, old white professor, I'm criticizing him, your writing's lousy. It takes a bit of courage. You can imagine if it's a young woman, it's even a little bit more. So there we are. Okay, um, one more example from advising, and then I think what I'm gonna do is uh, invite, uh, invite a couple of questions. Um, one of the things that I would suggest for any of you who are interested in advising in particular, since I'm selling advising as a, something that differentiates great universities from not so great, it's that every advisor should convey to their advisees, meaning the students. They could be first year undergraduates, age 18 or 19, or they could be like some of the folks here tuned in right now, you know, 23, 27, 30 years old or, or much older. 
Um, the goal is get to know one or two or three faculty members. Uh, ideally, have them get to know you at least a little during your time here. That's sort of the whole point of your being here. And that's one of the reasons you come to a great university. But here is where there's a big difference. We learned uh, the several of us at Brown, Duke, Georgetown, and Harvard. I assembled together with colleagues, 14 deans. We met every twice a year, basically. And um, we did a project exploring how to help first generation college students succeed. And these young men and women, undergraduates, have been accepted to demanding colleges. They're smart as a whip. They're very smart, which is why they're admitted. They've taken advantage of everything they can in their often not so great high schools. Some were great, most were not great. The question is, how do you help them succeed? And we advisors learn something. Example, tell your advisees, get to know a faculty member. Second, don't just drift in and poke your nose in a professor's office. Professor Light, got a few minutes? Well, no, I'm actually, I teach in six minutes. I don't have a few minutes. So well, I'd be happy to make an appointment. And that's the third point, make an appointment. And then the final point, okay, so see a faculty, get to know a faculty, make an appointment. And then the final thing is do your homework. Um, some students come in and they know why they're there to see a professor. Other students come in, professor, well, I'll use myself, professor Light, uh, I understand that you do research in education. I'd love to hear about it. And I'm just thinking, how do I summarize a lifetime of work in the next 11 minutes? It's, you know, it's like, I can't do that. So the idea just is little tips like that can be, um, can be terrific. Um, there are also some challenges and I, I won't go in, I'll just uh, the final example here really. And that just is my most awkward moment came with a young woman, advisee. I, I, I thought she was a pleasure. I think she enjoyed me too, but she always came dressed inappropriately, dressed inappropriately. I won't give more detail than that. I'll simply say, I was thinking, I asked my wife, uh, who's in the counseling service at Harvard Business School. I mean, and I, I said, I just, um, I'm trying to think, I'll do her a big favor if I say you shouldn't dress that way. But the truth is, God help me if she's offended. So I ended up not doing it, um, you know, whereas I was willing to do it with the, man, with the young man. It's delicate from the point of view of both parties in that transaction. John, maybe I should stop now if you're getting a couple of questions. I can going if we're not, and then I can stop in seven minutes from now. You, you choose. Yep. No, there are a couple of um, questions that we can, we can um, circle around here. One uh, that came up in the chat in the, in the Q&A uh, uh, app is a question about international students. Sure. And for international students whom English is not a first language, um, and what do you, you know, you gave a couple of examples, but how do you think about that, if at all, differently? Um, what would you propose from, you know, an advising perspective in terms of potentially, for example, the type of advisor uh, that would be most effective for that student? Um, that's, that's a very good question. And uh, I'm not just being polite. It really is a great question. Just to be clear, since this is a Kennedy School event, um, I, I simply want to observe uh, the Kennedy School has John as my number right. At least forty percent of our students, or thirty-eight percent, some big fraction, are international. Is that right? It's a, it's actually at least when I was executive dean, uh, we were almost slightly below fifty percent of the students were from countries other than the United States. Wow! I assume many of the international students, if there are some on the, you know, I assume there are some right now on this uh, discussion. Um, so you're half the Kennedy School. I can tell you among undergraduate places at Harvard College, it's about 13%. I don't know if you think that's high or low, but, you know, we could argue. The point just is there are plenty. There, there are plenty. You know, the, the, there are, Harvard has about 6,800 undergraduates, 13%. That's about 800 students. That's a lot of human beings. So to answer the question that, that you pose when it comes to advising, um, I would actually uh, be very blunt and direct, of course, very you know, kind, respectful, but in the end, very direct. And let me give a couple of examples because I have advised several international students. The first comment is, um, I don't know if any of these will surprise, surprise you. The first is, I'm not an expert on every country. Therefore, would I advise a student from 
South Korea differently from a student from Uganda? I'm not sure. Uh, from Kazakhstan. I'm, I'm genuinely not sure. Um, what I can say is, though, I tell all my advisees, and that includes several international students, a few key points. Key point number one is get to know the professor. I would tell them exactly what I just said to everyone. Second, make an appointment. I don't know what the customs are in Korea or Kazakhstan. I assume an appointment is sensible. But here are specifics. First, I would just say, because I don't know your background, because uh, how could I, um, the details, I encourage you to speak up in class. Instructors really value students who move the discussion forward. Even if you're taking a bit of a risk, even if you're unsure of your answer, take the risk, move the discussion forward. That's, it'll be appreciated, your classmates will appreciate it, and you'll feel kind of good that you're helping your class as well as learning something. The second suggestion I would make is don't feel afraid to disagree respectfully with your instructor. I mean, literally say, you know, um, I respectfully disagree. In Bulgaria, we do things all differently. Um, and I've actually seen that happen. I've had it happen in one of my classes. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. Someone's giving a different perspective. Everyone else in the room is learning uh, from that perspective. And then comes the slightly delicate point that I do, and I've learned, I've sort of screwed up my courage. And I say to my international advisees, and then as I say, you know, so many countries have delicate relationships with other countries. You have a choice. You can bring um, all those delicate, awkward, sometimes relationships into the Harvard classroom or any other classroom at any other university, or you can view your time here as the maybe one time in your whole life where you will have a chance to go and have lunch, you know, where if you're... Um, the Turks and the Greeks and the Palestinians and the Israelis and the group, this group and that group. This is a great chance and become good buddies. And the great news is that at great universities, it doesn't always happen, but it often happens. Okay, that, you know, in the spirit of time, that's my not too long answer. The one thing I would comment is that I found that um, international students or students from countries other than the United States sometimes don't understand the differences in the cultural norms. And to your point earlier about culture, just as an advisor to help them understand kind of what the norms are for classroom behavior, uh, for example, raising your hand, commenting in class uh, is quite useful. Um, we have a number of uh, questions in the, in the chat. Um, this one is, I find actually pretty interesting. How can universities support faculty to balance the pressures to publish in order to receive tenure and the time and effort needed for advising? How should the tenure process be um, revisited? Um, well, uh, this is a question that has no easy answer. For years, I have gone, every, cam every campus that I have, I was at the University of Texas a year ago, I'm sitting with the president in his office. And I said, what keep, you know, we had like 10 extra minutes. And I just said, Greg, what keeps you up at night? And he looks at me with a big smile and he just says, Dick, you mean you, it's not obvious to you? And I said, no, I'm asking a straightforward question. I really, what keeps you up at night? I, I had no idea what he's going to say. John, he posed your question. He just said, I, as president of the University of Texas, which I, I view as one of America's great public universities, and I should add, I agree with him. It is one of a great, America's great public universities. And um, he just said, I'm trying to figure out how do I get my faculty to do their research so they can advance academically, to care about their teaching, so, you know, for all the obvious good reasons, and on top of it, to take advising seriously. And I remember saying the only, you know, do you have any suggestions, he asked me. And I said, the only thing I can think of, which I suspect you've thought of already, is to say to your faculty, advising is part of your paycheck. The deal is, um, literally, the deal is you must spend a certain amount of your time advising. It may be, you know, three hours a week, but you've got to take it seriously, be well prepared, get to know a few advisees. Um, at the smaller campuses, private or public, but I'll use private um, as an example because there, there tend to be so many excellent small private liberal arts colleges. Most people don't attend them, but they, are, they exist and they're excellent. Um, it's very clear that the mission of a faculty member is partly uh, excellent advising. And um, what, what, I, what I guess is, if, 
if I were the president of such a college, what I would do is I would assign every faculty member, say six advisees, students or eight, when they're students of first year. And I would just say, you will be rewarded. You, you will be promoted. You will, your salary will depend upon those students succeeding. It's a little bit like rewarding a dentist, not for fixing the patient's cavity. It's rewarding the dentist to try to get the patients to have no cavities and take good preventive care. It's a funny kind of reward, but that's the best answer I can come up with. So we're gonna go back to the question about advising. And this one is, um, what techniques have great schools found most successful in getting students to take responsibility for making use of advisors for a reason, for a season, and forever? Uh, John, did you say great schools or G-R-E-A-T or G-R-A-D-E schools? I think you said G-R-E-A-T, yes? Great. How, yeah. What and techniques have great schools found most successful in getting students to take responsibility, getting students or advising. to take responsibility for making oh. use of advisors. Uh, let me give two concrete examples. And uh, I, I, I think in the description of this uh, webinar session, uh, I said, it said, you know, Richard Light will give two case studies. Here they are, two, two, here, as promised, two case studies. First, how many of you uh, tuned in today, have, it's gonna answer your, John's, this question. Um, how many of you have heard of a campus, I suspect not many, called Towson, T like Thomas, O-W-S-O-N like Nancy, Towson University. It's in Maryland, it used to be called Towson State. It's um, no one's idea of Yale. No one will confuse them. I mean, I'm being just very direct and blunt and unawkward about it. Um, the point is the students tend to be a bit less prepared and so on and so on. They decided, I think they're a great school in a particular way. They decided what they would do is make a special effort to take students who came from weaker backgrounds or low-income families or poor high schools and help those, I'll use the word kids because we're talking about undergraduates now, help those undergraduates to succeed. And they accomplished an astonishing thing that very few universities accomplish. Here are the precise numbers to the second decimal place. The overall six year graduation rate at Towson University in Towson, Maryland is 77%. You know, at Harvard, it's 98%. At Stanford, it's 98%. At Yale, it's 98%. And, you know, that that's, shouldn't be a surprise. What fraction of the students admitted? Almost all of them. Anyway, at Towson, it's 77. Now, suppose I ask among the entering African American students, many of whom come from lower income families, not a surprise. Many of whom come from imperfect high schools, not a surprise. There's no awkwardness about saying it. What's the graduation rate? 79%, two percent points higher. They're one of the few campuses in the whole nation able to do that. And the way they do it, John, to answer the question you posed about great universities is they just lay personal attention onto those students like no one would believe. Constant meetings. Uh, I mean, they're, they're described as open meetings, but it quickly becomes fairly clear it's targeted to low-income students, other places to students of color. Uh, but they're always open meetings. They're not. They're they're never just um, you know special subgroups where no one else is allowed to attend. Um, and they handle it beautifully, and the students love it. I mean, they're, they've got a happy group of students. So um, it's a happy situation. And now let me go to a more selective campus. Second case study is Georgetown. Um, Georgetown has a six-year graduation rate of 92%. That's, I mean, the national average is 54. So, I mean, Georgetown, 92, it's pretty spectacular. Suppose you ask, um, of the first generation college students at Georgetown, what's their graduation rate in six years from the day they enter? How many, what fraction graduated? 97%. That's the only other place besides Towson University that I have found in all my travels that can do that. How do they do it? There's a woman there named Melissa Foy, F-O-Y. Anybody who's interested, get in touch with Missy Foy. She's, she's just spectacular. She single-handedly rounds up the first generation students for extra meetings, extra sessions. Here's an example of taking advantage of advising. This your question you read, John, is can you get students to take advantage? 
Imagine, here's an example of what actually happens at Georgetown. It's worth a minute. I'm a first generation, first year student. Um, and I'm kind of finding my way. And I come from very modest circumstances. My phone rings in the middle of my first year. It's an alumnus calling at 24, graduated three years ago. Um, and this, let's say it's a man. And this man says, Richard, are you a first gen student? I think you are. And I say, yes, I am. I'm a first gen college student. And the caller says, well, I am too. And I'm a very proud graduate of Georgetown. I have a question for you. Are you thinking um, this coming summer of maybe interviewing for a job or even an internship somewhere? Well, either I'll say yes or no. Suppose I say yes. Then the caller, again, this is really happens all the time now for the last few years. The caller says, I have a question. Um, will there be, uh, are you actually going for an interview? Not just applying, but going for an interview. Suppose I say, yes, I'm applying to Fidelity Investments, make it up. And they're gonna interview me in person, pre-COVID, in person. Uh, and then the caller says, I have a question. I apologize if it's awkward. I intended to be unawkward. Do you have a tie and jacket to wear to the interview? Or if it's a woman, do you have a, you know, a a appealing, a, you know, straightforward, appropriate dress to wear to that interview outfit? And about half the students say, of course, yes. But then the other half say, uh, 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 well, actually, <clears throat> uh, uh, and the answer is they don't. Um, to which the caller says, you know, one of the alumni initiatives we first gen students have taken is, he said, look, I'm 24 years old. I just graduated two years ago. I can't write a check for $10 million to Georgetown. What I can do is write a check for $250. Many of us have done that. Georgetown has a program where they will um, uh, escort a group of first gen students to Joseph A. Bank right across the street from campus and help you pick out a sport coat and tie to wear to your interview. That's it, there is no more. Second step, um, th then the, Melissa Foy, who runs the Georgetown program, invites every first gen student who's applying for a job or anything else, would you like a practice interview? We will interview you. We're, we're gonna pretend we're Fidelity, we're interviewing you. You're gonna get to be better as an interviewee. And of course the students love it, they're so grateful. If you decline, most say this is great. Okay, end of story. What is the point? The graduation rate is astonishing. The kids, the kid, the undergraduates are grateful forever and they pay it forward. When they graduate, they then offer to help the next generation. It's a happy situation. I define Georgetown as a great university, if that reason for no other. So um, I'm gonna let you, we have other questions in the, in the queue. And uh, some of them I know we'll come back to because I think you're going to touch base on some of these issues. There's one that I'm going to just read real quickly because I think you basically have answered it, but just to keep it in the back of your mind. And the question is, Professor Light, what enhancements have you seen specifically with academic advising practices for first generation and underrepresented students like me with the institutions and research you have conducted? What recommendations do you have? I think you've answered that question maybe ex pretty extensively, but just keep it in the back of your mind if there are other Good. things that come. I'm going to turn it back to you to let you talk for a little bit more, and then we're going to open up in like another 10 minutes to, to, to more questions. This is great, and I'm feeling top of the world because I'm getting a few love notes here on the bottom of the screen. It's a pleasure. So this is great. Let me let me keep going. You know, kind of, you know what I mean. Kind notes from a couple of folks. Okay, here goes. Let me continue then. Another difference between great universities and the many that are just pretty good. I made up, I, I, let me start. I interview 40 undergraduates a year at Harvard College. For some of you who might say, that's a lot. Maria, it's one a week. That's, you know, that's easy. I can find 45 minutes. I mean, I sit one-on-one -on -one in person in my office and literally ask them a series of, we have 55 questions. Um, let me just share with you one of the big takeaways that I, I've done this at Duke, I've done this at the University of Texas, I've done it at, you know, um, St. Cloud State University, an hour's drive north of Minneapolis. My point is, look, St. Cloud State and Harvard, quite different. But what's really interesting is it's very obvious that great universities encourage students to do something that the pretty good ones don't always remember to encourage. And that is my words, I'm making these up now investing versus harvesting. You should all feel free to use those words as you wish. Uh, they, I put them in the book that I just submitted uh, to uh, the Princeton Press. Um, here goes, 
Um, imagine uh, you're a new student at college. Um, at a great university, advisor after advisor, dean after dean, repeatedly kind of drums into you, bangs into you, you need to do a bit of a trade-off, a juggling act. Continue to build on your strengths, but also try a few new things. I mean, you just arrived at, here at university, at college. You're a brand new first year student. It's nuts if you don't try anything new. So let me just be clear. The word investing means take a risk, try something new. You may or may not be good at it. Harvesting means reaping the fruits of your earlier work. Let me start, I'll start with harvesting. Suppose you were a runner, a cross country runner before you came to college and you're darn good at it. Well, my reaction is continue that in college, build on it, great, it'll give you pleasure. If you were editor of a, your high school newspaper, great, continue that in college. That's harvesting, it's paying off the hard work even if you're just quite young, you know, 19 years old. Then there's investing, that's trying a new thing. Suppose the editor of the high school newspaper arrives at uh, Georgetown or Duke or, you know, pick your place at Grinnell College. And that, that person then says, um, I think I want to join a singing group. So I'm going to try a new thing. And the idea is uh, that I, I, mean, I think it's great. They ought to try a new thing. They may be accepted. They may not. They may be a singer, but and then, and then they want to try to be the newspaper writer in college. All I'm saying is, Students report, when I said I interview a student a week, when I'm trying, you know, over, over a number of years, we have over 2,000 interviews accumulated. One of the big findings is the most successful, the happiest students, and this can be the, the first generation student all the way to a ninth generation legacy student, you know, who came here on the Mayflower. Um, the idea, both, both of them, the trick is to try to get a good trade-off and um, try a little bit of each. I often have advisees, my own advisees, and you know, they say what they're gonna do. And then um, I just said, what did you do in the past? And they list the exact same activities. And I just say, you gotta try one new thing. I mean, I don't have the secret answer. Maybe join the mountain climbing club if that's what appeals to you. But anyway, I think you all get the idea. So it's investing versus harvesting. Next point, what is another, I'm just trying to cover a lot. What differentiates good from, you know, pretty good from great universities? The great universities unawkwardly, unselfconsciously are constantly experimenting with new ways to teach, different ways to teach. And I would love to give my single favorite example of that. It has nothing to do with me. Um, about three years ago, let me give credit here to my colleagues at the Kennedy School, Dan Levy, and Richard Zeckhauser. Here goes. Um, several years ago, several of us were at a meeting with a man named Carl Wyman, W-I-E-M-A-N. Who you ask is Carl Wyman? I suspect most of you never heard of him. The secret truth is before I met him, I never heard of him either. Well, he happens to be a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And he taught out at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, he's now moved on to Stanford. But the point is, at the time he was at Boulder, and he came and he gave a talk here on the Harvard campus. And he said, isn't it crazy? We all who teach, he said, I teach, you teach. We give exams. The students, we have a final exam. Um, students come, they sit there for two or three hours. They take the exam. They get a grade. They go home. That's the end of it. What did they learn from taking the exam? Well, they studied for the exam. That's good. But basically the exam was not a learning experience. Let's convert the process of all exams at any college or university in the world to make it a learning experience. And I remember uh, one of my colleagues, it may have been Dan Levy saying, well, what exactly do you propose? And he said, it costs zero. You don't have to be a rich campus to do it. He said, instead of a three hour exam where everyone sits alone on their own behind all by themselves, in their chair, answering questions, and then you leave and you go home and say, done. And the only point seems to be to get a grade. Uh, you know, you hope you got a good grade, but that's the only point. Um, instead, suppose you give an exam and it's two hours instead of three. You do it the usual way. Everybody sits alone on their own butt. The new thing is then for the final hour after a three minute break, 
For the final hour, the students are divided into groups of four. And they're, they go to different places in a room and they get their chairs so they can face each other. And they discuss the exam. They discuss all the questions on the exam. They have a whole hour to do it. And then the students each have minutes at the end of that hour to write up revised and improved versions of their answer. So suppose I were a student and you know, question six on the economics final exam, I had written something, but I realized when I discussed, we all discussed what would make a sense, what would make sense, I could improve my answer. I, I wrote the wrong thing. I get a chance to change it. And the point then is that might count, say, of the 100 points on a final exam, you can make up your own number. I'll make up the number. It could count maybe as much as 10 points, but it's worth something. And, you know, could be the difference between an A and an A minus or an A minus and a B plus. And the point is the students, um, we tried that. Dan Levy tried it. Richard Zeckhauser tried it. Several others have tried it. The University of British Columbia in Canada, obviously, has tried it. The University of Colorado, Stanford tried it, and Harvard's tried it. And the point just is the students all say the same thing. I actually learned something. I'm walking out of here. That three-hour experience, I've got four new insights. That's not the way most students think about a final exam. There's one example. And I want to give a couple of others because I hope they'll ring a bell for people. First, I'm going, to, I'm going to use an example from the Kennedy School since this is a Kennedy School webinar. Again, I'll mention Dan Levy. He tried in one of his introductory, I think it was statistics classes, he basically tried an experiment, and that is he asked, um, will students learn more if they're asked to post responses online? Let's say they get a homework on Monday and the next class is Thursday by midnight the night before or 4 a.m. that morning, you know, whatever his time deadline, let's say midnight, Wednesday night, students should post a brief response to a question, thereby, number one, showing they did their homework, number two, it sort of forces them to do their preparation. That's good for the class. And classmates have access, you know, it's all posted in a blog, like on a blog. So everyone can learn from everyone else's insights. And the question is, by doing that with half the class, not doing it with the other half, he, Dan Levy did a wonderful randomized controlled experiment and he did it twice. The question is, are students learning more? All my faculty friends predicted, of course they'll learn more. Most of the students said, I think I'll learn more. Guess what? We learned posting does not change learning one bit, at least measurably. I mean, it doesn't hurt. It just, uh, it, and it in fact increases the preparation time, which you could say is a good thing if you want your students to spend more preparation time. Anyway, there's an example. And my, my final example um, it has a, a personal meaning to me. The several of you who were my students this past fall, I taught two classes. Several of you I know are logged in. Um, I'll just say, as you all know, I'm a big fan of cold calling, meaning I don't only call on students who raise their hand. I start that way, but then I'll cold call, meaning I'll say, Sally, Sally, you haven't spoken up today. I'd love to hear what you think. The point is I want Sally to get her one minute of airtime. And with smallish classes, 20, 25, you can do you can't do it with 100. What's the punchline? Um, several experiments on cold calling done by Dan Levy with um, uh, a few other folks, Josh Goodman, here at the Kennedy School, have found that also hardly, hardly improves learning. It was to my surprise. I didn't, I didn't expect that. Um, I'm going to see if I can get one more finding in here. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Yeah. I want to give one more finding, and that's, I said at the very beginning, great universities ask the students for feedback and ideas. Let me tell you my favorite question when we interview students at Harvard at the end of their first year. I'm sitting one-on-one -on -one with, you know, some young woman, some young man, it could be black, white, you know, who knows from what country. It could be American. It could be international student. And I ask questions. Then I get to my favorite question. Pretend you're dean for a day. What is one constructive change you would implement, even if you love this place, you're so happy and successful to make it even better, but say something constructive. You know, don't tell us we need to add tomatoes to the salad bar, you know, a little bit better than that. Um, to which we've got great ideas from students. And I wanna just give one example, because it changed something at Harvard. It's a Harvard example. 
After asking some undergraduates that, that question, Dean for a day, what would you change? Many of them, not millions, but say, well, a few dozen said, um, there's something crazy here. Harvard has a thousand professors. I take four classes a semester, times four years as an undergraduate, two semesters, that's eight semesters, I will meet 32 professors, but Harvard has a thousand. That means, you know, 97% of the professors, I'll never hear them say a word and they're great. That's one of the reasons I came to Harvard to, the, for the faculty. So here's the bottom line. Following the students repeated observations, uh, I actually shared this with some student leaders and they said, great, we'll do something. And this was not my idea. I credit two students several years ago. They made up a program. They literally made it up based on their own suggestions. I had to give them the feedback, but they then, they get all the credit. And they just, they called their program 10 big ideas, 10 professors, 10 minutes each. And what they did, they asked 10 very popular and really outstanding uh, professors, each to talk for no more than 10 minutes, 10 different people, and just share the one big idea from their field. They held it in an auditorium called Standards Theater, which seats 1,100 students. The first time they did this several years ago, they had no idea. It was in the evening, on a random Tuesday evening in the winter, on a cold night. They had no idea how many students would show up. The lines snaked around the block. It was not only standing room only, but they had, there were two, te what is the word, telecasts basically to other large rooms. There were nearly 3,000 undergraduates. They loved it. What's the point? Everyone who showed up heard 10 different professors each for their few minutes. They got one big new idea from each professor. And the, how much did it cost Harvard? If you're the treasurer of Harvard, how much did it cost? Zero. I mean, just you know, using Sanders Hall, a Sanders Theater evening. That's what it cost. The professors were not paid anything. They were honored to be, to be asked. They loved to talk. So they got their chance to talk in front of a big audience. The students were thrilled. Everyone was happy. So even the least rich college or university in America or in uh, Uruguay could in implement that idea. John, with my eye on, I could go forever. With my eye on the <coughs> to be respectful. May I turn it back to you if you have two or three more questions? There are a few questions in the queue and I'm gonna pull them up. Some of them you've addressed, but I'm gonna give you the opportunity if you wanna expand a little bit. Uh, the first one is, um, do you see common characteristics or trends amongst great universities that have an innovative culture? To go back to your kind of first point about the importance of culture and the, what you were just talking about now, are there specific systems, practices, or processes that can be studied, examined, or scaled across institutions to promote innovation? To promote innovation, sure. Um, the, the answer is yes. You know, uh, I, I just, my, my honest response to that very good question, I mean, I, lo I love the question, but I, I'm, I'm gonna be blunt. And that's sort of, that's why we're all here. Um, my, my answer is every campus needs sort of a cheerleader, a leader, someone who will do what exactly whoever wrote this question or the several folks who wrote some version of this, every campus needs a leader to try to do it. And I want to give a very specific example. Again, I'm, forgive me if I'm a bit Harvard centric today, but you know, you're all connected. You're logged into Harvard. I, I come to work every day at Harvard because of the pandemic. I unfortunately have been sitting, you know, at nowhere but Harvard. So the point is, I want to give an example from Harvard, but I think it will answer, John, the question uh, you just posed. One of my favorite questions asking undergraduates is, these are now graduating seniors. And I just pose what I think is a straightforward question. Think of all the classes you took here as a student. Which one had the biggest impact on you and why? And um, I, I want to tell about George. It's one guy, one person. He was a graduating senior at Odin. He took me so seriously. Actually, it was, it was a pleasure. And he said, mm, let me think, let me think. Yes, I know what it is. It was my junior year seminar on East European politics and history. And, you know, I'm sort of staring at him. I, I don't know him. I mean, we're just matched at random. And I just said, oh, really? Well, it had a big impact on you. He said, it changed my life. Uh, and this is my point about any university can do this. Uh, and it can be spread so easily just by hearing these examples. Anyway, I said, well, George, 
Tell me about it. The, I mean, an obvious question. Why did it change your life? How did it change your life? What happened? And he said, very simple. We basically were discussing relatively recent East European and Russian politics, history, and literature. And he said, we came once a week for three hours, Thursday afternoons, two to five, we all met. There were 15 of us in the seminar. It was quite a luxury, only 15, that's a good thing. Anyway, he just said, for the first three or four weeks, the professor gave kind of the standard assignments, you know, read chapters three, four, and five in the book for next week, come prepared to discuss. And then comes the, the sort of the, the bullseye. He said, in the fifth week, the professor gave a different assignment. And he looked, he, I, I remember these very clearly. Um, he looked me in the eye and he said, Professor Light, what's your reaction to this homework assignment? I, he said, I know this is not your field, but what's your reaction? He said, the professor said, your assignment for next Thursday is on December 12th, 1993, the Russian people voted overwhelmingly to approve a new constitution. Your assignment for next week is one, read the new Russian constitution in translation, since most of the students are not fluent in Russian. Anyway, read the new constitution. Part two, read the old Russian constitution. Part three, browse the American constitution to remind yourself of the key points. Next week, your assignment is come prepared to discuss A, the differences between and similarities between the new and the old Russian constitutions and B, the differences and similarities between the new Russian constitution and the American constitution. And this young man started laughing. He said, Professor Light, honestly, what do you think of that assignment? You know, we're all, we're all adults here. And I just, I said, honestly, what I think? I think it's nuts. And he said, why? And um, I just said, it's way too much. I couldn't begin to do that. And he started laughing. He said, that's the point. That's why I brought this up. The professor is really smart. And he agreed it's nuts. He agrees with you. So the professor divided us up into groups of five, three groups of five. Each of us specialized in a different part of that assignment. Then we all reported back to the class. He said, look at the skills I learned from that class. First, um, I had to learn to divide up work constructively. Second, how to get the work done. Third, how to function effectively in a small working group of five people. My four colleagues were not all my closest friends, we were sort of strangers, but we had to figure out how to work together and make a presentation. And he said, finally, can you imagine how hard we work? We must have had seven meetings outside of class in that one week to get our act together to not embarrass ourselves. I I'm done. So this young man said, everywhere I look, when I look for jobs, Google, Facebook, Snapchat, Dropbox, and you know, we could tell them 200 other names like that. Um, in every one of them, nobody goes and works alone. Everyone works together. I learned how to work collaboratively in that Eastern European history and politics class. So I guess what I'm trying to say is any great university should, number one, look for findings like that by asking their students what worked well and then replicating it over and over and over again. I hope that's a reasonable answer. So we have hit the witching hour. We're right at noon or a few seconds over. Um, so if you feel like you need to leave, uh, don't be shy. Um, I will say we've got probably another couple minutes um, and there are some questions that are related in the, in the uh, chat box that I wanna just give to Dick and, and feel free to drop off if you need to drop off, but Dick has offered to stay on for another five minutes or so. And I'm gonna lump all these questions together, Dick, because they have a common theme, which is really around advising. Um, and how do you have more effective advising? And the first one is, you know, how do you suggest navigating delegate advising topics with students without offending or discouraging them? You've talked about this a little bit. Second one is, what are your thoughts on advising outside of an academic context, such as career services? There's yes. so much emphasis these days on employment outcomes. I wonder how non-academic advising can contribute to student success and personal growth. And the last one is, can you list some of the baseline competencies for great advising? particularly with a student body with a broad array of identities. Please include the professional development areas that might make good advising functions into great advising functions. Uh, small questions for you to answer in five right. minutes or less. 
Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, well, you know what? Maybe, maybe I have a sort of global answer to all those. You've just posed three slightly different questions, but they're on this, they're obviously all subcategories of this broad thing, this broad idea called good advising. How about I just say it's completely clear to me that the diff again, I'm going to focus on the same word choice, the difference between great universities versus, you know, the many that are fine. I mean, no one's angry at them. They're, they're fine. But the difference between the great and the not so spectacular is that the great universities figured something out. And I'm so struck when I visit the not so great ones, when I ask a question, it often seem, comes across as if it's a new insight. Um, and... Um, uh, so here goes. Here's my specific example. I'm going to ask everyone who's still logged in, this, you know, since it's a couple of minutes after noon now, everyone who's logged in, how many hours are there in a week? Okay, a little arithmetic. Seven days, 24 hours a day, seven times 24, 168 hours. I'll ask every student, how many hours a week do you spend in classes, in your formal classes, at the Kennedy School? at uh, undergraduate, whatever the, heck, <laughs> whatever the heck it is. I'm getting funny comments, what, whatever it is. Um, so the answer is what? Typically what, 12, four courses, three hours a week, maybe four courses, four hours a week, you know, 15, whatever it is. Well, out of 168 hours, that leaves more than 150 for everything else. I think one of the roles of a good advisor is to help uh, each student fully capitalize on those 150 hours. I don't mean they have to be focused every minute of those 150 hours that they're not sleeping. I mean, you know, that, that's crazy. You know, spend your time with your girlfriend. That's, you know, more, more power to you. That's not the point. The point is, though, try to be constructive, even in informal interactions with classmates. Um, how about I just say, uh, here are two short examples of when I advise, I use these examples. I really do use them with my students and the students seem to like them. So let me share them with everyone who's still logged in. The first one is this. Um, most all of you I'm sure either have seen or, or have heard of, have heard of the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, DC. Um, do many of you know the name of the person who designed it? Well, let me just finish my own story. Her name is Maya Lin, L-I-N. And she designed it when she was an undergraduate at Yale. I never met Maya Lin. But what I can tell you is Yale has a legend and it's true. And that is, um, there was a contest open to anyone in, in the world, design a Vietnam War Memorial. One day, Maya Lin, as a Yale junior, age 20, or whatever she was, was sitting in the dining hall with three friends. And she told them about the contest and they knew she was interested in architecture. And they said, well, what would you design? And she took the, this is not a joke. You may think I'm joking, I'm not. She took the mashed potatoes on her plate on the table in front of her three friends and pushed the mashed potatoes around and said, this is the, this is the way it would look. And her friends said, that's unusual. That's actually quite spectacular. You ought to apply. And she said, don't be silly. I'm 20 years old. I'm competing against, you know, um, you know, I am pay. I'm competing against world-class architects. They said, no, 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 you're, this is, you ought to, you should, the point is they encouraged her. The end of the thing is the end of the story. She was chosen. And that's the end of uh, the impact of an outside of class, the 150 hours a week outside of the classroom experience. I'm going to use my other example because I happen to love it. Um, I'll bet everybody on this call has either used or knows perfectly well what Federal Express is. Well, how was Federal Express started? I mean, somebody started it. It didn't come flying out of the air out of nowhere. Um, as a Yale, I have no connection to Yale. These are two Yale stories. I have zero, zero connection in any part of my life. Um, there's a man named Fred Smith. I mean, he's a real man. Uh, so he's a guy. He was at Yale in the late 60s. And as a course assignment, he was told in an economics class, applied economics, write a business plan for a new company, but it has to, that will be profitable and useful to Americans and indeed internationally, uh, but it has to be an idea that's actually doable. It can't be a, a total pipe dream, imaginary thing. 
So he basically wrote a design for Federal Express. He basically said it'll be reliable, it'll have a hub. He didn't have a, you know, it, it now has Memphis as a hub. He hasn't chosen that yet. You know, he was 20 years old. He handed in his paper. He got it back with a grade from the professor, B minus. That's really, that's really true. And, and the professor wrote, love the idea, but it's totally impractical. So all of his friends encouraged him and said, the hell with the professor. May the professor have a nice rest of his day. You should start the company you envision at Federal Express. He did. And some exactly 50 years ago in 1971, um, he, he had 28 airplanes carrying three packages. That was their first day in business. He had 28 small single propeller airplanes carrying packages, but with high reliability to different places. What's my point? The point of these two, I think, kind of mildly entertaining anecdotes is that's what you get for going to a great university, in this case, Yale. Um, but you go because it's all the stuff outside of class that can make the real uh, difference. I think you're muted, John. With that, Dick, I just want to say thank you so much. That was terrific. Um, I noticed in the chat a number of people, including some faculty, saying always what time well spent with you, Dick, and uh, how they learn. And I've learned some things that are going to affect how I think about teaching and my role at the Kennedy School. So thank you so much for that. And for all of the attendees, um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, and it's terrific to have you here. And hopefully you uh, will find time outside of your classes to come join, some, join us for some of the other seminars out of the center. Um, thank you, Dick. Thank you all for taking the time out of what I know are busy days, folks, um, to join me. And in all seriousness, thank you, John, for hosting. And I hope this is a little helpful. Even if you find, you know, half of these ideas helpful, everyone wins. Have a good day.